As Eric said, it's good to be back. I'm, I've been out a little bit myself. It's always wonderful to come back to my church family. Great to see you this morning. Uh, we want to celebrate with Ben back there in the sound booth. He's starting a new job, full-time job tomorrow. So excited. <laughs> And uh, I just want to reiterate what, what Eric had already announced is that this is the week where we've crammed everything. If you're a man or a woman or a teenager or a college student, you've, you've got something this week. So the men, we had a great time uh, bowling lane against lane and then played some games last night that involved bluffing and anteing maybe. Um, and uh, the women, yeah, they got the pool party Wednesday, then Friday is the college young adults, then Sunday is the youth group. So it's the week that it's all happening. So my family's coming back in town tomorrow night just to be back for all that stuff. So, um, all right, let's get to it. Uh, this is, we are in Luke, and we're all the way up to Luke chapter 11. So turn with me. To Luke 11, we're just going to read the first 13 verses and work our way through that this morning. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, give us each day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation. And he said to them, Which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, Do not bother me, the door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Later in this chapter, Jesus will say, Blessed are those who hear the Word of God and keep it. Let's pray. Almighty, eternal, merciful God, Your Word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our paths. Open and illuminate our hearts and minds this morning that we may better understand Your Word and conform our lives to what we've understood. In the great name of Jesus we pray. Amen. There's a question I've seen in interviews sometimes with uh, celebrities, famous people, and that question is, who's the most famous person in your phone? All right, so it's usually like a not super well-known celebrity who then has to say, well, I've got Beyonce on my phone, and, and everybody kind of gushes that, ooh, you're that important that you have that number. And I wonder if we polled people, if we would find that maybe you have someone famous on your phone, I bet we could get in touch. Certainly the six degrees of separation. You could call somebody that would know somebody. I don't know any really famous people. I know some Christian famous or maybe Presbyterian famous, which, you know, far from a household name. But imagine, I think I've heard these stories before, Phones got so much security and, and passcodes and all these things. I remember hearing a story about somebody that found some famous person's phone and then realized that they had access to all of their contacts and, and had all these famous people's numbers. What would you do with that? 
How, how exciting is it to think that you have some kind of access to someone who's influential? Right? Imagine having an athlete, actors, uh, musicians, the cool people in society that maybe you could call them up, talk to them. Well, as we enter into understanding this passage, let's remind ourselves we have something infinitely greater than that. Right? Who cares who's on your speed dial in your phone when you have the Creator of the universe to call anytime you want. The One who created you. The most powerful being who knows the secrets of the universe. Every detail of every particle in the galaxy. The true source of goodness and truth. You can call Him anytime, day or night. And you don't have to preface it with, uh, Hi, I'm, I'm Dave. I'm a big fan of your work. Uh, he knows who you are. And He'll take your call every time. So as we jump in, as we look in depth at Jesus' instructions to His disciples on how to make that call to our Heavenly Father, how to pray. Jesus gave His followers the green light to call on the Father early and often. My main idea this morning is that persevering in prayer shows that we know God and that we trust Him to answer and provide. So in the first four verses of Luke 11, we are reminded of the familiar pattern for prayer. So that's my first point. Pattern for prayer. Let me reread those first four verses. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when He finished, one of His disciples said to Him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught His disciples. And He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be Your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation. Now, volumes, huge books have been written about that prayer. We're going to just scratch the surface this morning. But if you want to learn about something, the best person to go to is an expert, right? And so the disciples watching Jesus pray decided, hey, teach us. Show us how to do that, right? That's like somebody applying for a job, getting to talk to the CEO behind the scenes and getting all the inside information how to perfectly interview and land the job. Now, I want us to think about the fact that we don't need to be restricted to these words. I'm sure you've thought about that. that Matthew's version that we did in the responsive reading, Jesus says, pray like this. Right? So what I'm driving at today is that we use the Lord's prayer as a structure, as a model, a skeleton, maybe even a scaffolding that you would build around. So each section, each phrase of the prayer gives us an area that we can expand upon. Now, there are certainly times, particularly in corporate worship, we're going to do it during our uh, communion time later, where we say it together. It is a corporate prayer, our Father. Uh, but with private prayer, we can and we should expand upon that. So, we're going to look closely. And, and I divided, the, the prayer easily divides into two sections, your and our. So the first half of the prayer is your, focused on God. It's so important to start with God. We are such self-centered creatures that we risk spending all of our time on ourselves, missing the main point of prayer. Coming to God, communing with Him, praising Him, getting a greater sense of who He is. This part of the prayer is actually the part that's the hardest most neglected. You know, it's so easy to kind of treat it as a prologue. We get past that so I can tell you what I need, what I want, and give, give God our list of, of requests, right? But this ha has the opportunity to be the most formative part. Tim Keller tells the story of a woman who came to him and said that when she would pray and tell God her problems, she was still so anxious and upset by them. 
but she said that she resolved to spend 80% of her prayer time in adoration, of praising God, of, of testifying to who He is. And she said, I suddenly realized the reason I worried and got upset and scared was because I didn't realize how great He was. And by the time I thought about His greatness and His wisdom and all He has done for me, when I got to the time of petition, I just said, why am I worried? Here, take it. When we start with God's glory and character, it casts a shadow, a good shadow over the smaller things in our lives. It puts everything else into context, everything that's going to come after. I don't know if you know this, God is only referred to as Father 14 times in the Old Testament. And every time it's in reference to the nation, right? Not to an individual. God was Israel's father. But Moses and Joshua and David, they didn't, they didn't really say, my father. Jesus came and changed that. Jesus says that if you believe in Him, then His Father is your Father. We have the privilege to call Him Father because we are His adopted sons and daughters. You have the same legal standing and family relation to God the Father as Jesus the Son does. You're not entering into the throne room by right as Jesus does. You are entering by privilege on the basis of God's covenant love through Christ. Now, I realize that some people hear that Father word and have either had neglected, absent, or worse, abusive fathers in their lives. And so it is hard for them to identify with God as Father. But I would encourage you to sing songs like Your Name is Holy and Glorify Your Name and, and say things, pray things like that. But it's not just His name we're praising, right? We're saying that everything about Him is holy, perfect, set apart. We glorify Your person, Your total being. The, the word that the ESV translates from Greek to hallowed has a root word which can mean consecrate, sanctify, dedicate, reverence, purify. Those are all kind of really religious, churchy words, but you get the point. This is the place where you offer adoration, where you tell God how great He is. Ponder His amazing qualities. Not because He's a needy God and He needs to hear that, but because we forget. And we live as though He isn't great and powerful. We are made whole. And God is glorified as we lift Him up. When we praise Him, we remember, we do what we were created to do and will continue to do for all of eternity. The next phrase is, Your kingdom come. A prayer for God's work on earth. Right? God's kingdom is not a geographic region. It's not a system of government. It is His rule and authority over creation. And it's kind of a, a twofold idea. The, the now that God would work through His people and His church. And a prayer for what we call the not yet. The still to come for the end that will come when God establishes His eternal kingdom. When I pray this prayer, I use that time to pray for our church, to pray for ministries that I know of, for God to work, to heal, to save. Right? The more the church and individual Christians act out the mission of God to teach and live the gospel, the more earth becomes like heaven. We need to petition God to save people because we can't change an unbeliever's heart. Only He can. We can't make revival and two true church growth happen. He can. Even as He uses us as His hands and feet, as His means, we ask Him to accomplish kingdom work. Now, to pray for the kingdom is not necessarily to say that you wish Jesus would come get us and get us out of here as quickly as possible. That's not really what we mean but that His beauty and His truth would reign here. 
We're praying that God's kingdom will take the place of our kingdoms. We're asking God to set things right, to push back all that harms and destroys, to save His creation. Now, I know we're used to adding your will be done. And, and in the Matthew's version that we already read in the responsive reading, that's, that's added there. But that's essentially implied here. Your kingdom come is for God's will to be done. Just like the other phrase that Luke leaves out that Matthew had in there is, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, it's implied. Right? So, uh, it, either Jesus taught this on multiple occasions, and Matthew and Luke had different versions of it, or it was the same time, and Luke just wanted a little more compact. We're covering the same ground. So, let's get to the second half of the prayer, which then turns to us, the our section. And I've got three requests in there. Good preacher fashion, they all start with P. So, we've got provision, pardon, protection. Let's work through those. Provision is, is to give us each day our daily bread. And with our Costco-sized groceries and our stuffed pantries, uh, sometimes it's hard to think about needing God for our daily bread, right? And, and yet for the majority of the people on this planet, many here in Kent County even, That's still a true prayer. That's still a real need. It's interesting because the early church fathers kind of denied that this was that had anything to do with kind of literal bread or physical things, right? They said that must be spiritual. We have to spiritualize that. And then the reformers came along and John Calvin said, No, that's ridiculous. And Martin Luther said, No, this means the necessities of life. It's it's absolutely literal. And so it's food, it's asking for a healthy body, homes, spouses, children, good government, peace, necessities, not not luxuries. We're to bring those requests to God. Now pardon. Forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. I don't know if you've had this thought. I used to wonder, why do we have to keep asking for forgiveness? I was taught and believe, and still believe, that when you are saved by Christ's redeeming death, that all of your sins, past, present, and future, are forgiven. Why do we have to keep asking for forgiveness? And... I think what helps me make sense of this verse is there's a difference between being forgiven by God in the ultimate sense and what we call the legal courtroom sense and being forgiven by God in the family room. All right? This is a prayer in the family room. That's the key to this verse. And additionally, it sounds like our forgiveness from God is linked to our forgiving other people. Again, I think we need to separate this from our prayer for forgiveness for ultimate salvation, right? You are forgiven of your sins in a saving way only through the atoning work of Christ. You don't add anything to that. So it's not about us forgiving other people there, but in the family room. Now that we're Christians, we, God is our Father, and we ask daily forgiveness to clear our relationship with Him. So we use this part of the prayer, we confess our sins by name. We ask for His ongoing forgiveness, for the ability then to turn from our sins and change. And we ask for the grace and ability to forgive others. If we cannot forgive others, it's either because we've never received God's love and salvation in the first place, or because we've lost sight of all that we've been forgiven. You've probably heard that phrase, hurt people, hurt people. Well, let's add this, forgiven people, forgive people. And let's own that. Last part, protection. Lead us not into temptation. Another one I didn't totally understand when I first heard it. Because I had also heard James 1.13. 
that says, let no one say when he's tempted, I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. So why are we praying this? And I came to understand that I think we're meaning more along the lines of, well, what's usually linked is deliver us. Don't abandon us in temptation. Right? 1 Corinthians 10.13 God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation He will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. And so we pray for God to deliver us from those things that ensnare us. Sometimes I think we, we get this idea that it's, it's more holy, spiritually robust to be in the middle of temptation and to just ward it off. But I think we want to stay far away. Pray this prayer. Keep us from temptation. Deliver us from it. All right. Having analyzed Jesus' prayer, we need to remember that just having a pattern for prayer won't necessarily make us effective. We, we have to have determination and perseverance. So my second point is persistence in prayer. That's verses 5-10. through 10. Let me read those again. And He said to them, Which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, Do not bother me. The door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though, he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Now, two things to remember about the culture in Jesus' day. Number one, hospitality was a big, huge, big deal. Right? Number two, don't forget, midnight, markets are closed. There aren't convenience stores. There's nowhere else to go but to bug your neighbor. And so there's, there's three men in this story, apparently. There's the man who was sitting at home, but his friend dropped by. And he didn't have any bread, so he had to go to his neighbor and bug him. Right. So this, this man who had no bread left, when his friend showed up unexpectedly, was no doubt embarrassed that he couldn't be as good as host as he wanted to be. So he goes and leans on his neighbor to show good hospitality, good hospitality to bail him out. Right? Now, have you ever heard this phrase? Your lack of planning does not constitute an emergency for me. You can put that in your pocket. You may need to use that someday. It's not a bad phrase in every situation. <laughs> but it seems like yeah, this is the initial reaction of this man who's been awoken at midnight with his kids all in bed. Uh, the house is locked down, right? We're asleep. Done for the night. I'm not, I'm not helping you. Go away. But Jesus said he gets up and he gets the bread. Because they're friends, neighbors? Nope. Because of one word. One word in Greek, anodyne. So in, in the ESV that we, we read from, that's translated impudence. But it can also mean persistence, perseverance, boldness, even shamelessness. I think we would say he had a lot of nerve. Right? Most of us, a lot of us like to beat around the bush and, and not really say exactly what we need. We kind of hint at our needs. I, I do this when I recruit for things. Hey, wouldn't it be great if we had people that love Jesus and served in the nursery? You know, and it's not super direct, but maybe somebody will pick up on it. But I think Jesus is telling us, be direct. Be persistent. Be bold. Even shameless in prayer. Hebrews 4.16, let us then with confidence or boldness 
draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now, we, we put together the pieces of this parable and, and we're the first friend who's coming and, and God is the neighbor, right? But let's be careful. This is not an exact picture of God. I don't think you can't press these details too far. It, God doesn't get annoyed at us when we bring him these things. God doesn't need to be pressured or exasperated so much that he has no choice but to give in. So we'll, we'll just shut up and stop asking. All right, if we have that in mind, we, we have distorted the character of God in our prayers. All right, that's not what Jesus is saying. It's the idea that if your inconvenienced neighbor can be persuaded to help you, how much more will your Heavenly Father hear you? Prayer is not trying to get things from God that He doesn't want to give. Right? It's God's way of seeing if we will admit our need and acknowledge that He is the giver of all good things. James 4 Verse 2 says, you do not have because you do not ask. I forget that way too much. A week will go by and I'm wrestling with something. You'd think after being a pastor for all these years, that'd be my first instinct. But it's not always. Ask, seek, and knock in verses 9 and 10. Those are continuous verbs. Those are not, they're not done once. They're done multiple times. Keep on asking. Keep on seeking. Keep on knocking. We don't say, I asked God for that and it didn't happen, so I gave up. No, we persevere. In fact, I think if we're unwilling to persevere, it reveals something about you or about your prayer subject. Either the thing you're praying about doesn't matter enough, or you don't have enough faith that God will grant that prayer. And I I definitely see that in myself. Because I know, I I pray for people in my life to come to faith in Christ. But it becomes every once in a while when I'm thinking about it. It's not a persistent prayer. And so I recognize that either I'm not bothered on a constant basis that this person might be lost for eternity, or I don't have a ton of faith that God will actually save them. I I won't usually admit those things out loud, I just did, but if I'm not praying persistently, then that's probably what my heart actually believes. I pray that He would change my heart in both of those areas so that I would be more faithful in prayer. As we had a sermon recently, Lord, I believe... Help me in my unbelief. The last three verses reflect on the character of the one that we petition in prayer, and you're going to be disappointed. It doesn't start with a P. I just thought I would make it as plain as possible. God answers our prayers. That's what Jesus is driving at. Verses 11 through 13. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Jesus was saying that that most parents would not answer their children's simple requests with dangerous, harmful things. Right? Both of my earthly fathers, my dad and my father-in-law, are super generous. They'd give you the shirt off their back. They're constantly lavishing me and my family with things. And I recognize wanting to love my kids and give them things. A couple weeks ago, I think I told a lot of you that story, uh, we were in Milwaukee uh, the day that the Milwaukee Bucks started their playoffs. And I just knew if I got a ticket for me and Natalie, she would just go crazy. And so we didn't tell her about it till right as we were walking up to the stadium I, or the arena. I said, let's just take pictures. And then I told her, I got the two of us tickets. And it, sure enough, it's like the greatest thing to see a child receive that gift 
We love it. But Jesus says that earthly fathers pale in comparison. He actually calls us evil. I, I don't think he's saying necessarily that we're as terrible as we could be, but by our very nature, we're evil, selfish people in, in comparison to God the Father. We fall short in every way. If, if we who are bent towards evil give good gifts, our perfectly heaven, perfect Heavenly Father gives the best gift. He is greater in every area. Romans 8.32, remember this, he teaches that Christ's sacrifice on the cross is a reminder. It's a sign. It's a promise that, that God is a gracious God and will continue to give. He who did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all, how will He not also with Him graciously give us all things? That's a beautiful thought. Now we don't twist this idea. I didn't want to spend too much time on this idea. Um, and we don't join the prosperity preachers and say, see, God has to give you anything you ask for. James 4.3, you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passion. So there's a lot we can talk about, about asking in God's name or Jesus' name and, and His will. But I want us to focus on what God, what Jesus says is God's favorite gift to give. Did you notice in verse 13 what He said? His favorite gift is the Holy Spirit to those who ask. That's the greatest thing we could get. We may think we want possessions and health and friends and rewarding lives and all kinds of material, tangible things. And like I said, there's no shame in asking for those things. Right? Bring those to the Lord. But our greatest need is to have the Holy Spirit inside of us moving to be stronger spiritually. Think about what... what that says the, the Son is promising that the Father will give the Spirit. What beautiful Trinitarian idea, language, that the Spirit will lavish their love upon those that they have adopted into their family. The Spirit, uh, there was a book about the Holy Spirit called Forgotten God. And sometimes we, we kind of treat Him last or the least, but the Holy Spirit, when you think through all that He does in our lives, the conviction of sin, the assurance of our forgiveness, the gift of faith, the miracle of salvation and spiritual adoption, giving us gifts for ministry, and then the ongoing work of victory over our sin. That is the Holy Spirit empowered in our lives. Ask for that. God loves to give it. Now, maybe you're like me and you struggle to pray. And we have external reasons and rationalizations. Everybody's too busy, too much stuff on their plate, right? Sometimes maybe, well, I pray more than that person does. Comparisons. But, and internally, maybe it's even more troublesome. Like I already said, we, our hearts don't necessarily believe that God is going to do or that prayer is going to change anything. I want to read quickly this letter, uh, part of a letter that an atheist father wrote to his Christian son in a book called Letters from a Skeptic. I've actually quoted that before in a different sermon here. Um, here's what he says, I don't see that prayer ever works. Not only this, but I don't see how prayer ever could work. If God is all good and all powerful and concerned about us, doesn't He already want the best for us? And so wouldn't He already be doing as much as He can ever do for us? So what are you asking for in prayer? For Him to care more? Well, supposedly He already cares as much as He could. Are you asking Him to do more? He's supposedly already doing everything He can. Are you informing Him of some problem so He'll do something about it? He supposedly already knows everything. So you can't inform him about anything, you can't coax him to do anything, and you can't empower him to do anything. So what the heck are you doing when you pray? The whole thing seems like a total waste of time to me. 
How's that for blunt honesty? Is prayer just a waste of time? Will God really change? Can you accomplish things? I mean, there is a sense that all the things you're praying in the Lord's Prayer will happen whether you pray it or not. Right? God is going to be praised. His kingdom will come. His will will be done. He will provide protection and pardon and, and provision for His children. I guess the question is, how much do you want to participate in and benefit from those things? We could go really deep, but we're going to move to the table. But theology, there's a, there's a mysterious interaction between God's ordained, predetermined action and our prayers and choices, right? Again, I, I can't, I'm not going to solve all of your questions and problems with how God's sovereignty interacts with our wills. But the short answer is that even though He has ordained all things to pass, and He is the first cause of all things, He gives us the freedom to make choices that have consequences, good and bad. I didn't say it was free will. It's a will that is enslaved to sin or to Christ. But He comes, He wants us to come to Him in prayer with the knowledge that our prayers will change things. Always, we, we realize that He can... An- answer with yes, no, or wait, but He tells us to come, to talk to Him. And in that process, He conforms us to the likeness of Christ so that we will pray even more in His will. As the old song says, what a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. It's a privilege to sit at our Father's feet and tell Him about our lives. To ask Him to further the things that will glorify Himself and that will sanctify us. Jesus says that His heavenly Father is the most loving, generous Father you can ever have. Do you believe it? If you do, then approach the throne of grace with confidence. Ask. Seek and knock, and it will be given to you, be opened to you. We approach the throne of grace in our prayers. And we approach the table of the Lord this morning together as a family. And as I started to flesh out that God is our Father because He is Jesus' Father. They are one in the mystery of the Trinity. But we only become sons and daughters and can truly call God our Father through the shed blood of Christ. And so this morning... We ponder Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. We think about His mission to come to the earth, to live a perfect life that fulfilled the law in every respect in our place. And then He gave Himself up willingly on the cross so that our sins would be dealt with. Our sins would be nailed to the cross. But it is those who acknowledge Jesus, His Lordship, and His sacrifice. Jesus doesn't take the sins of every person. He takes those who come to faith in Him, who believe in Him. The work of the Holy Spirit in our lives to bring us to faith in Christ. And so we call all of those who have made that decision, who have come to faith in Christ, to consider Him our Lord and Savior, to participate in this meal, to celebrate and remember what He did for us. But we also use it as an invitation for those 
who have not maybe decided that yet, who have not been convinced that Jesus is the Savior. And we would tell you, we would love to talk with you more, but we would ask you not to partake of this. We don't want you, your actions to lie and say that you understand salvation and redemption when in fact you haven't settled that in your heart. But we will pray that God would bring you to a knowledge of His work. And so we say that any member of a Bible-believing church or those seeking membership are welcome to come. We have made the provision. We're going to continue to say that children who have not yet been made communicant members and met with the session about a profession of faith refrain as well until we have that time. But those who have committed in their hearts to follow the Lord, this is your table. Now, uh, 1 Corinthians 11 tells us that before we partake of the Lord's Supper, we examine ourselves. And so we take a few moments now to acknowledge our sins and ask for God's forgiveness, as the prayer says. Let's do that. hear the reminder of our forgiveness and justification in Christ from Romans 5.1, therefore having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the forgiveness of our sins. Let us recite the Lord's Prayer together. It is a communal prayer. This will probably be closer to the Matthew version, but let's Pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. So now we invite you with the instructions I gave earlier to come forward. Larry will dismiss you by row, by family. Come forward, grab both a cup with the bread and a cup with the juice. And take those back to your seat. I will consecrate the elements. We'll take them together.